Hey everybody, Hoosier Jedi here with uh, not exactly a review, but just some comments and thoughts on the movie Aquaman. Uh, another movie came out in most places uh, a while back, but I live in Japan where it came out uh, only four days ago uh, as of this recording. Um, I was actually going to go and see it uh, Sunday, two days after it came out, but uh, they only had one showing that was going to be uh, subtitled and uh, not the uh, extra expensive 40x one that costs like another 10 bucks so 10 15 bucks yeah so uh, I kind of held off figuring it would be uh, less crowded and cheaper uh, well less crowded anyway uh, if I went uh, on a weekday when I had the time had the day off and I was correct uh, anyway uh, all in all this is a good movie it definitely has its flaws um, Particularly the pacing. I mean, there's this. There, there were more than a few times when I'm like, looking at like, how much longer is this movie? Because, like, the, the, the nothing's really that much has happened so far, and there's still a lot of stuff they've got to get through. Uh, so that would be, I think, the biggest problem with this movie. But that said, all in all, I really like this. Um, I mean, it was co-written by Jeff Johns, who's a really great writer, one of the best people at DC for writing stuff, and uh, it really draws on a lot of the recent Aquaman lore, particularly with like the other kingdoms of the sea and uh, all of that, and it just does a really great job. And there's a there's like just so many great actors and actresses in this movie. I mean, you got Jason Momoa, you got Nicole Kidman, like Dolph Lundgren is in there. Uh, his Aquaman's dad is the uh, the fellow who played Chango Fett. I mean, how cool is that? Um, and I do like that the story is both at times very simple and complicated. Um, but what I mean by that is, this is a very, very straight hero's journey kind of story. I mean, it's seriously, seriously textbook hero's journey. Uh, that said, I like how, like, um, well, I'll save that for the spoilers. Um, anyway. Um, James Wan is uh, somebody who I'm not super familiar with, but boy howdy does this guy deliver. Uh, this is sort of like uh, how I felt after I saw Guardians of the Galaxy, which was my first real James Gunn movie. I'm like, whoa, this, this guy's talented. And uh, even the people who uh, were notable detractors of this movie have said that the, the, the CGI in Aquaman is absolutely amazing. And yeah, no kidding. It's great. This is absolutely amazing. Um, you know, I think if you're talking about any sort of uh, underwater fantasy related stuff, probably for quite a lot of time, uh, people are going to be looking at this movie for inspiration. It's kind of like how uh, so much stuff uh, in you know, science fantasy uh, draws from Star Wars. Heck, if you ever played the video game Rogue Galaxy, the plot is painfully lifted from Star Wars. Uh, but it's still a fun game. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, a, a lot of people I think are going to who, who uh, toy around with any sort of underwater stuff are, are going to be looking at this movie for some inspiration, and but, you know that's fine. Um, oh yeah, and of course we can't forget Dolph Lundgren is in this movie. Uh, oh, and oh god, man, I was like looking at King, like who is that? I, I I know I recognize this guy. Who is it? And it's like the beard was throwing me off. But I had to I had to get to the crest. I'm like, oh of course it was Dolph Lundgren. And and I gotta say, um, I was uh, really I was really digging seeing uh, Willem Dafoe as Volko. Um, you know, he Willem Dafoe is such a great actor. Uh, and it was sort of nice to see that he doesn't really go very over the top in this movie, which few people go over the top better than Willem Dafoe. I mean, if you've seen seen some of his other stuff, he can really go there. Um, but anyway, this was uh, the first time I've actually seen him in anything since I watched uh, that um, Death Note movie that they made for Netflix. But uh, anyway, yeah, good stuff from Willem Dafoe. Uh, great performance from Nicole Kidman. Uh, and and uh, this movie was just great because it had like it told a really good it told a pretty good, if very very simple story. 
There's a nice mix. There's lots of good action, amazing CGI. Definitely had some very nice, funny moments. Um, and despite the very simplistic nature of the story, um, if you think about think about it in some levels, there's more to going on under the surface than what you might initially think. And I'll talk about that in just a second. But uh, from that said, uh, I would kind of want to give anybody who's not interested in spoilers a chance to step away, though God only knows why you're watching this if you haven't already seen the movie. But anyway, we'll give you a five count. Okay, uh, before I go on, um, I, again, I live in Japan, and I was watching this movie with the Japanese subtitles, and uh, one of the nice things about movies in Japan is that movie theaters often sell uh, goodies for the movies in the lobby. And uh, as is my habit, I uh, picked up something uh, in the lobby. This is a, what they call it a clear file, and basically you're just supposed to stick papers in here. Um, that's all it is. It's just a little piece of plastic, but these are only like four bucks, and they're like super cool souvenirs. They did have some other nice Aquaman stuff, like I was giving serious thought to buying a pin with the uh, Aquaman logo on it, uh, but I decided to kind of hold off. Uh, I was thinking about this before I went to the movie. When I came back out to the lobby after the movie, somebody had already bought it. <laughs> so, yeah, he who hesitates is lost. Um, anyway, so getting into it, what did I wanted to say here um, was, um, oh yeah, and one other thing, a person I forgot to mention, John Reese davies um, He's actually in this movie very briefly as the voice of the King of Prime. I didn't know that until I watched the credits. Uh, you know, he's, yeah, it's, it's, it's always good to see him and stuff. Uh, anyway. What I noticed about this movie is it um, it followed an idea that I saw somebody pointed out uh, when they're actually talking about this story of uh, of all things uh, the philosophy of Dragon Ball, like the anime series. And I'm not a big big Dragon Ball fan, but I just kind of watch that because I like uh, these sort of videos. It's made by the people from Wisecrack. And anyway, the point that they make here is, and I'll keep this really brief, is that. During the initial story with Dragon Ball, like in the Peel of Sodom, Peel Off Sodom, um, they point out that whenever the characters do something that's selfish, it ultimately hinders their goals. When the characters act selflessly, they advance their goals. And this is actually, I think, really present here in Aquaman. When the characters do things that are selfish, they ultimately hurt themselves in some way, shape, or form. When they do things that are positive, they help themselves in some way. Um, and the biggest example here is when, uh, at the beginning of the movie, when uh, Aquaman is fighting a Black Manta on before he becomes Black Manta on the sub. You know, he basically tra like basically he has the choice to help Black Manta save his dad. And he says, like, no, you guys came in here and you murdered a bunch of innocent people. You know, him dying here, well, you know, that that's kind of what he deserves, you know. You know, you didn't show these innocent people any mercy. You want to ask for mercy, ask it from the sea. So basically that's Aquaman deciding that he or deciding that he has the right to choose who lives and who dies. And this is even after Black Manta be literally okay, he doesn't basically begs him. Please help me save my father. I mean, he just says, please. But you can tell that's killing him to do that. He is begging Aquaman, help me save my father's life. And Aquaman just tells him, yes, yeah, screw you, and walks off. And this kind of ties into sort of the general philosophy of the DC heroes. Is that with, with, most ex with exceptions here and there, heroes in the DC universe do not ever kill their enemies. I mean, people have said again and again, why doesn't Batman kill the Joker? Well, the answer to that is very simple. Batman, like most of the DC heroes, holds life to be sacred. He thinks that I don't have the right to decide whether or not another person, even somebody like the Joker, should continue to live. That's what the Joker does. That's what like most a lot of the villains, especially the Batman villains, do. They decide, hey, um, this person doesn't deserve to die. They've done something that made me angry, they're in my way, or I'm crazy and just kill people for fun. But they decide they have the right 
to take the lives of others. And it also kind of ties into the idea that in killing the Joker, or, any, or killing any villain, the heroes don't actually make the world a better place. They, even if they did, they would all they would be doing is removing a negative factor in the world. They would be removing a malfactor. That doesn't make the world better, it just makes it less bad. Um, there's this quote, uh, I believe it's from Gandhi, or something similar, but it goes basically, um, kindness, only kindness can change the world for the better. It's the only thing that ever has. Again, killing the Joker only removes something bad from the world. It doesn't make the world better. There's an important difference there. And in, in any case, like I said, Batman, the other heroes of the DC Universe, in general, hold life to be sacred. And that's kind of a general rule for most superheroes. There are, of course, exceptions. Or in superheroes who will try to um, resolve things peacefully if they can, but if they don't, and this is an interpretation that's actually become uh, more common these days with Wonder Woman even, um, if they can't resolve pe things peacefully, and there is no other way, then they will kill. Like Captain America uh, has been demonstrated as somebody who will try to do that. Um, there was a story where um, the only way Captain America could stop a, a guy from killing someone else was to take, he was too far away, and the only way to stop him was to take a sniper rifle and kill the guy with a sniper rifle, which is exactly what he did. Captain America, he, as a reminder, is a soldier. And a soldier is someone who is trained to take the lives of others if it is necessary. Um, anyway, but getting right back to this. So Aquaman decides, okay, screw this guy, he's a murderer, I'm not going to help him. And this goes and turns his son into someone, you know, who's, who takes a guy who's already a bad person and a murderer and essentially creates someone who's on track to become his arch enemy. It's when um, Arthur starts to sort of stop being selfish, to open himself up to other people, to show kindness and compassion to others. That's when he really starts to succeed at stuff. You know, for he has this very at first combative relationship with Mira. After she he, she helps save his dad's life, okay, he's a little bit more on he's on board with the whole okay, I'm going to help you thing. I don't want to do this, but you saved my dad's life. So there, there's an example. Mira saves his father's life. You know, the thing that he didn't do, and that pers pers creates the positive change in in Arthur. I mean, he's still pretty reluctant about the whole thing, and it's kind of like, okay, I owe you, but he's still going along with this. And again, as their relation, as they, they spend more time together, it's still kind of rather combative. But by the time they get to Italy, uh, those two have bonded a little bit. Mira starts to see the better side of Arthur. You know, he's having some fun with her. She shows kindness to the little girl, and. Um, Arthur also shows that his intelligence, he shows that he's able to use his head to solve problems, the whole thing with the statue and the bottle. So again, he demonstrates, you know, a positive behavior, and that helps him to succeed. And <clears throat> particularly, like, later on, when uh, he finds his mom and is going to try to get the trident, Arthur talks to the big creepy sea monster and basically says, like, yeah, you're right, I'm nobody. I don't want to be king. I just don't want the people I care about to die. That's why I'm here. It's not because I want to sit on a throne and boss people around. And it's because his desires are not selfish that he's able to succeed. He is able to properly claim the mantle of Aquaman and get the cool, iconic armor, slightly modified, of course, for uh, mainstream audiences today, but still. And then, after he fights Ocean Master and wins, he refuses to kill him. Uh, you know, like his Orin screams in his face, you know, 
you know, kill me, that's our way. And Arthur says to him, well, in case you've forgotten, I'm not one of you. I'm going to do things my way. And it is, this harkens back to that speech that he gave to Orin earlier in the movie where he said, like, you know, when I was young, I used to dream about, like, the thing I wanted most in the world was to be able to meet you, to kind of, like, you know, get to know my brother. And, you know, we would, we would take on the world together. We would have each other's backs always. And that, plus being reunited with his mother, that brings a notable change to Orin. He, like his mom tells him, like, look, your father deceived you all this time. It's not that he misguided you. This isn't what I would have wanted for you. And you see, this this strikes a chord with him. And Arthur even says to him after it's all over, we'll talk. So there's the real possibility that because of his compassion, Orin is somebody who might be redeemable. I mean, this is a guy who flat out murdered a fellow king and engineered uh, the, uh, and basically did a false flag operations that injured another king. He's not a great guy. He's also a guy who didn't even make the tiniest attempt at diplomacy with the surface world. I mean, stop and think about this. What if these undersea kingdoms simply made themselves known to the surface dwellers? Okay, that means there's got to be some sort of formal diplomatic relations. Uh, as soon as they can say, like, hey, all this crap you're dumping in the ocean is literally poisoning our children. Well, you really think that uh, there aren't people who are on the surface who are going to be like, uh, hey, we're, we're causing children to die. They're children that lived under the ocean, but they're children nonetheless. We, we need to do something about this. And uh, the, 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 the ocean dwelling people would immediately have people who would advocate for their interests. And these are all pow like notably powerful kingdoms with militaries and technology and all of this. There, there are people that could easily be ignored. And that's, you know, not ignoring the economic possibilities, the technology possibilities. Uh, I mean, like when uh, they pour and throws all this garbage up onto land along with all the battleships. Well, okay, why not use that ability, work with the people of the surface, and, and, and they start cleaning up the oceans together? Uh, again, the idea that nobody is even dreaming of any sort of diplomacy is kind of ludicrous. But you can just sort of, and you pretty much would have to, sort of writing it off to the isolationist tendencies of these people. I mean, uh, they've been under the ocean for the better part of 2,000 years. Okay, that's, that, that's going to get some stuff ingrained. And, of course, that also gives Arthur something to do in the next movie. What happens if Atlantis sends ambassadors to the United Nations? That, again, it gives him a role, a unique role. He is meant to be the bridge between the surface and the land. Now, um, since I live in Japan, I was watching this movie with Japanese subtitles, and my Japanese is far from perfect, especially when it comes to reading Japanese and writing Japanese. Ooh. That's a pain in the ass. Uh, anyway, but I understand enough that I can, a lot of the time, follow along with what's going on in the subtitles and compare it to what, the, what it is that the actors are actually saying in English. And one notable thing in the Japanese version is that a lot of the, th like, more than, especially more than in the English dialogue, a lot of, Arthur says, this is my fault. It's my fault. Or it's in English, he still says something like "this is because of me," or something like that. It doesn't. The words are not exactly there, but the kind of the idea. And again, only at least don't if you know if you know anything about translating between languages, understand this: only idiots translate literally. Okay, that's just how it is. Translation is an art, not a science. But the Japanese version, he's much more. Um, 
explicit in saying, I consider this situation to be my fault. And again, that's not really in any notable way different than what he says in English. But again, it's just more explicit that he is directly saying, this is my fault. And you can just sort of chalk that up to the simplicity of translation, but it's something that I, that I kept thinking about. And it does drive home the part that for all this bad stuff that's happening, Arthur is at all the times blaming himself. Uh, anyway, guys, it's been 20 minutes, so I think that's good. So let's call it here. Uh, as always, please comment, rate, subscribe. Of course, you can follow me on Twitter at Who's Your Jedi, and also join me on Tumblr, Jedi Reviewer. Until next time, take care and have a good one.